Ashley Rook, reading Nora Roberts' book, Rising Tides, Chapter 1. Got us some nice pillars here, Captain. Jim Boleyn, cold crabs from the pot, tossing the marketable catch in the tank. He didn't mind the snapping claws and had the scars on his thick hands to prove it. He wore the traditional gloves of his profession, but as any waterman could tell you, they wore out quick, and if there was a hole in them, by God, a crab would find it. He worked steadily, his legs braced wide for balance on the rocketing boat, his dark eyes squinting, and a face weathered with age and sun and living. He might have been taken for fifty or eighty, and Jim didn't much care which end he stuck him in. He always called Ethan Captain, and rarely said more than one delicate sentence at a time. Ethan altered course to, towards the next spot, his right hand nudging the steering stick, the most watermen used rather than a wheel. At the same time, he operated the throttle and gear levels with his left. There were constant small adjustments to be made with every foot of progress up the line of traps. The Chesapeake Bay could be generous when she chose, but she liked to be tricky and make you work for her bounty. Ethan knew the bay as well as he knew himself. Often he thought he knew it better. The fickle moods and movements of the continent's largest estray for 200 miles it flowed from north to south, yet it measured only four miles across, where it brushed by Annapolis and 30 at the mouth of the Potomac River. St. Christopher sat in snug on Maryland's southern eastern shore, depending on its generosity, cursing, if it, cursing for it, its captrice. Ethan's water, his home waters, were edged with marshland, strung with flat land, rivers with sharp shoulders that shimmied through thickets of gum and oak. It was a world of tidal, tidal creeks and sudden shallows, where wild celery and wondergrass rooted, and it had become his world, with its changing seasons, sudden storms, and always, always the sounds and the scents of the water. Timing it, he grabbed his gaffing pole, and in a practice motion, as smooth as a dance hook, dance hook pot line drew in, drew it into the pot puller. In seconds, the pot rose out of the water, streaming with weed and pieces of old bait, and crowded with crabs. He saw the bright red pinchers of the full-grown females, or sooks, and the scrowling eyes of the jimmies. Right smart of crabs was all Jim had to say as he went to work. Heaving the pot aboard as if it weighed ounces rather than pounds. The water was rough today, and Ethan could smell a storm coming in. He worked the controls with his knees when he needed his hands for other tasks, and eyed the clouds beginning to boil together in the far western sky. Time enough, he judged, to move down the line of traps in the gut of the bay and see how many more crabs had crawled into the pots. He knew Jim was hurting some of for cash, and he needed all he could come by himself to keep afloat the fleeging boat building business he and his brother had started. Time enough, he thought again, as Jim. Jim rebated a pot with thawed fish parts and tossed it overboard. In leapfrog fashion, Ethan gaffed the next bowie. Ethan's sleek Chesapeake Bay Retriever Simon stood, front paws on the gold well, tongue low, and like his master, he was rarely happier than when out on the water. They worked in tandem in a near silence, communicating with grunts, shrugs, and occasional oaths. The work was comfort, since the crabs were plentiful. There were years when they weren't, years when it seemed the winter had killed them off, or the waters were never warm up enough to tip them to swim. In those years, watermen suffered unless they had another source of income. Ethan intended to have one, building boats. first boat by Quinn was nearly finished, and a little beauty it was, Ethan thought. Cameron had a second client on the line, some rich guy from Cam's racing days, so they would start another before long. Ethan never doubted that his brother would reel the money in. They'd do it. He told himself, however doubtful and full of complaints Philip was, he glanced up at the sun, he gave the time in the clouds, sailing slowly, steadily eastward. We'll take them in, Jim. They'd been eight hours on the water, a short day, but Jim didn't complain. He knew it wasn't so much the oncoming storm that had eaten piloting in the boat back up to get boys home from school by now. He said, yeah. And those sets were self-sufficient enough to stay home alone for a time in the afternoon. Ethan didn't like to tempt Fate. A boy of ten and with Seth's temperament was a magnet for trouble. When Cam returned from Europe in a couple of weeks, they would jungle, juggle Seth between them. But for now, the boy was Ethan's responsibility. The water in the bay kicked, turned gunmetal gray, and out a mirror of the sky. But neither men nor dog worried about the rocky ride. As the boat crept up the steep fronts of the waves, then slid back down in the truffaces. Simon stood at the bow now, head lifted. 
His ears blown back in the wind, grinning his doggy grin. He then had built the work boat himself, and he knew she would do. As confident as the dog, Jim moved to the protection of the awing and cup in his hands, lit a cigarette. The waterfront of St. Chris was alive with tourists. The early days of June lured them out of the city, tipping them to drive from the suburbs of D.C. and Baltimore. Imagine they, they thought of the little town of St. Christopher as quaint. With its narrow streets and clapboard houses and tiny shops, they liked to watch the crab pickers' fingers fly and eat the flaky crab cakes or, or tell their friends they'd had a bowl of she-crab soup. They stayed in the bed and breakfasts. St. Chris was the proud home of no less than four, and they spent their money in the restaurants and gift shops. Ethan didn't mind them. During the times when the bay was stingy, tourists kept the town alive, and he thought there would come a time when some of those tourists might decide that having a hard built hand built wooden sailboat was their heart's desire the wind picked up as ethan moored at the dock jim jumped nimbly out to secure the lines his short legs and squat body giving him the look of a leaping frog wearing white rubber boots and a grease smeared gimme cap at ethan's careless hand signal simon plopped his butt down and stayed in the boat while the men worked to unload the day's catch and the wind made the boat's sun faded green awing dance Ethan watched Pete Monroe walk toward him, his iron gray hair crushed under a battered bill hat, his stocky body outfitted in baggy khakis and a red checkered shirt. Good catch today, Ethan. Ethan smiled. He liked Mr. Monroe well enough. Though the man had a bone deep, stingy streak, he ran Monroe's crab house with a tightly closed fist. But as far as Ethan could tell, every man's son who ran a picking plant complained about profits. Ethan pushed his own cap back, scratching the nap of his neck, where sweat and damp had drew. Good enough. You're in early today. Storm's coming. Monroe nodded. Already his crab pickers, who had been working under the shade of a stripped awing, were preparing to move inside. Rain would drive the tourists inside as well. He knew to drink coffee or eat ice cream. Sound days. Since he was half owner of the Bay Street Eats, he didn't mind. Looks like he got about 70 bushels there. Ethan let his smile widen. Some might have said that it was a hint of pirate in the look. Ethan wouldn't have been insulted, but he'd have been surprised. Closer to 90, I'd say. He knew the market price to the penny, but understood they would, as always, negotiate. He took out his negotiating cigar, lit it, and got to work. First fat drops of rain began to fall as he motored to her home. He figured he'd gotten a far price fair price for his crabs is 87 bushels of crabs if the rest of the summer was good was as good he was going to consider dropping another hundred pots next year maybe hiring on a part-time crew oystering on the bay wasn't what it had been not since parasites had killed off so many that made the winters hard a few good crabbing seasons were what he needed to dump the lion's share of the profits into the new business and to help pay the law lawyer's fee. His mouth tightened at the thought as he rode over the swells toward home. They shouldn't need a damn lawyer. They shouldn't have to pay some slick-suited talker to clear their father's good name. Wouldn't stop the whispers around town anyway. Those would only stop when people found something juicier to chew on than Ray Quinn's life and death. And the boy, Ethan Muse, staring out over the water, the troubled under a steady pelting of rain, there were some who liked to whisper about the boy who looked back at them with Ray Quinn's dark blue eyes. He didn't mind for himself. As far as Ethan was concerned, people could wag their tongues about him till they fell out of their flapping mouths. But he minded deeply that anyone would speak a dark word about the man he loved with every beat of his heart. So he would work his fingers numb to pay the lawyer, and he would do whatever it took to guard the child. Thunder shook the sky, booming off the water like a cannon fire. The light went dim as dusk, and those dark clouds burst wide to pour out solid sheets of rain still he didn't hurry as he docked at his home pier a little more wet to his mind wouldn't kill him as if in agreement with the sediment simon leaped up to swim to shore while ethan secured the lines he gathered up his lunch pail and with his waterman's boots watched wetly across the dock heading for home he removed the boots on the back porch his mother had scalded his skin often enough in his youth about track and mud for the habit to stick to the man still he didn't think anything of letting the wet dog nose in the door ahead of him until he saw the gleaming floor and counters. Shit was all he could think as he studied the paw prints and heard Simon's happy bark of greeting. There was a squeal, more barking, then left. You're soaking wet? The female voice was low and smooth and amused. It was also very firm. It made Ethan wince with go. Out, Simon. Out you go. You do dry off on the front porch. There was another squeal, baby giggles, and the accompanying laughter of a young boy. The gang's all here, Ethan thought, rubbing rain from his hair. 
The minute he heard footsteps headed in his direction, he made a beeline for the broom closet and hit him up. He didn't often move fast, but he could when he had to. Oh, Ethan! Grace Monroe stood with her hands on her narrow hips, looking from him to the paw prints on her dish wax. I'll get it. Sorry. He could see that the mop was still damp and decided it was best not to look at her directly. Wasn't thinking. He muttered, filling a bucket at the thing. Didn't know you were coming by today. Oh, so you let wet dogs run through the house and dirty up the floors when I'm not coming by. He jerked his shoulder. Floor was dirty when I left this morning. Didn't figure a little wet would hurt it. Anyway, then relax a little. It always seemed to take him a few minutes to relax around Grace these days. But if I'd known you were here to skin me over, I'd have left him on the porch. He was grinning when he turned and she let outside. Oh, give me the mop. I'll do it. Nope. My dog. My mess. I heard Aubrey. Absently, Grace leaned on the door jam. She was tired. That wasn't unusual. She had put in eight hours that day, too, and she would put in another four at Shiny's Pub the night serving drinks. Some nights, when she crawled into bed, she would have sworn she heard her feet crying. Seth's minding her for me. I just switched my days. Mrs. Linney called this morning and asked if I'd shift... I'd shift doing her house till tomorrow because her mother-in-law called for her from D.C. and invited herself down to dinner. Mrs. Lenny claims her mother-in-law is a woman who looks at a speck of dust like it's a sin against God and man. I didn't think you'd mind if I did y'all today instead of tomorrow. You fit us in whenever you can manage your grace, and we're grateful. He was watching her from under his lashes as he mopped. He always thought she was a pretty thing. Like a palmino, all gold and long-legged, she chopped her hair off short as boys, but he liked the way it sat on her head, like a shiny cap with fringes. She was as thin as one of those million-dollar models, but he knew Grace's long, lean form wasn't for fashion. She'd been a gangly, skinny kid, as you recall. She'd, ne she'd have been about seven or eight when he first come to St. Chris and to the Quins. He supposed she was twenty-couple now, and skinny wasn't exactly the word for her anymore. She was like a willow slip. He thought very nearly flushing. She smiled at him, and her mermaid green eyes warmed, faint dimples flirting in her cheeks. For reasons she couldn't name, she found it entertaining to see such a healthy man, specimen, wielding the mop. Did you have a good day, Ethan? Good enough. He did a thorough job with the floor. He was a thorough man. Then he went to the sink again to rinse the bucket and mop. Sold a mess of crabs to your daddy. At the mention of her father, Grace smiled him a little. There was distance between them. Had been since she'd become pregnant with Aubrey and had married Jack Casey, the man her father called the no-counting grease monkey from upstate. Her father had turned out to be right about Jack. The man had left her high and dry a month before Aubrey was born, and he'd taken her savings, her car, and most of her self-respect with him. But she got through it, Grace reminded herself, and she was doing just fine. She would keep Right on doing fine, on her own, without a single penny for her and her family, if she had to work herself death to do it. She heard Aubrey laugh again, a long, rolling gut laugh, and her resentment vanished. She had everything that mattered. It was all tied up in bright-eyed, curly-haired, headed little Rachel just in the next room. I'll make you up some dinner before I go. Ethan turned back, took another look at her. She was getting some sun, and it looked good on her. Warmed her skin. She had a long face that went with a long body. Though the chin tended to be stubborn, a man could take a glance, and he would see a long, cool blonde, a pretty body, a face that made you want to look just a little longer. And if you did, you see shadows under the big green eyes and weariness around the soft mouth. You don't ask to do that, Grace. You gotta go home and relax a while. You're on the shinies tonight, aren't you? I've got time, and I promise that's sloppy joes. It won't take me long. Shifted as Ethan continued to stare at her. She longed to go, except that those long, thoughtful looks from him would stir her blood. Just another of life's little problem, she supposed. What? She the man and rubbed a hand over her cheek, as if expecting to find someone. Nothing. Well, if you're going to cook, you got to hang around and help us eat it. I'd like that. She relaxed again and moved forward, take the bucket and mop from him and put them away. Aubrey loves being here with you and Seth. Why don't you go in there with them? I've got some laundry to finish up, then I'll start dinner. I'll give you a hand. No, you won't. It was another point of pride for her. They paid her. She did the work. All the work. Go on in the prop room and be sure to ask Seth about the math test he got back today. How'd it go? Another A. She winked and she would ease away. Seth had such a smart brain, she thought, as she headed into the laundry room. Off the kitchen, if she'd had a better head for figures for practical matters when she'd been younger, she wouldn't have to dream her way through school. She had learned a skill, a real one, not just serving drinks in tenant house or picking traps. She had have had a career to fall back on when she found herself alone and pregnant, with all her hopes of running off to New York to be an answer, dashed like glass on brick. It had been a silly dream anyway, she told herself, unloading the dryer and shifting the wet clothes from the washer into it. 
Pie in the sky, her mama would say, but the fact was, growing up, there had only been two things she wanted. The dance, and Ethan Quinn. She never got neither. She sat a little holding the warm, smooth sheet she took from the basket to her sheet. Ethan's sheet. She'd taken it off his bed that day. She'd been able to smell him on it then, and maybe for just a minute or two. She let herself dream a little of what it might have been like if he wanted her, if he had slept with her, slept with him on those sheets in his house. But dreaming didn't get the work done or pay the rent or buy the things her little girl needed. Briskly, she began to fold the sheets, laying them neatly on the rumble dryer. There was no time, no shame in earning her keep by cleaning houses or serving drinks. She was good at both in any case. She was useful and she was needed. That was good enough. She certainly hadn't been used or needed by the man she was married to so briefly. They loved each other, really loved each other. It would have been different. For her, it had been a desperate need to belong to someone. To be wanted and desired as a woman. For Jack, Grace shook her head. She honestly didn't know what know what she had been for Jack. An attraction, she supposed, that had resulted in conception. She knew he believed he'd done the honorable thing by taking her to the courthouse and standing with her in front of the dresses of the peace on the chilly fall day and exchanging vows. He had never mistreat her he had never gotten mean drunk and knocked her around the way she knew some men did wives they didn't want he didn't go sniffing around other women at least not that she knew about but she'd seen as aubrey grew inside her and her belly rounded she'd seen the look of panic come into his eyes then one day he was simply gone without a word the worst of it was gray stopped now she'd been relieved jack had done anything for her it was to force her to grow up take charge and what he'd given her was worth more than the stars she put the folding la folded laundry in the basket hitched the basket on her hip walked into the front room there was a treasure her curly blonde hair bouncing her pretty rosy cheek face alight with joy as she sat on ethan's lap and babbled at him at two aubrey monroe resembled a borderless angel all rose and glit with bright green eyes and dimples tending her cheeks little kitten teeth and long fingered hands though he could decipher only half her chatter he's nodding soberly and what did foolish do then he asked as he figured out she was telling him some story about Seth's puppy lick my face her eyes laughed but she took both hands and ran them up over his cheeks all over granted she cupped her hands on Ethan's face fell in the game she liked to play with him ow she giggled rub his face again bared obliging he skinned his knuckles over her smooth skin the director said ouch you got one too no you no he pulled her close and planted nosy kisses on her cheeks while she in the like you screaming with laughter now she wiggled away and dived for the boy sprawled on the floor set beard she covered his cheek with sloppy kisses man who did man did that he wins jeez ob give me a break he distracted her picked up one of the toy cars and ran it lightly down the road you're a racetrack yeah her eyes beamed with a thrill of a new game. Snatching the car, she ran it not quite so gently over any part of Seth she could reach. Ethan only went, You started it, pal. He told Seth when Aubrey walked over Seth's thigh to reach his other shoulder. It's better than getting slobbered on, Seth claimed, but his arm came up to keep Aubrey from tumbling to the floor. For a few moments, Grace simply stood and watched. The man relaxed in the big wing chair and grinned down at the children. The children themselves their heads closed one delicate and covered with gold curls the other with shaggy mop shades and shades deeper the little lost boy she thought in her heart went out to him as it had from the first day she'd seen him he found his way home her precious girl when aubrey had only been only a flutter in her womb grace had promised to cherish to protect and enjoy her she would always have a home and the man who had once been a lost boy slipped into her girlish dreams years before and had never really slipped out again. He had made a home. The rain drummed on the roof. The television was low, unimportant murmur. Dog slept on the front porch, and the moist wind blew through the screen door. She yearned where she knew she had no business yearning to sit down on the basket of laundry to go over and and climb into Ethan's lap to be welcome there, even expected there, to close her eyes for just a little while and be part of it all. So she retreated, finding herself unable to step into that quiet, lazy ease. She went back to the kitchen where the overhead lights were bright and just a little hard. There she set the basket on the table and began to gather what she needed to make dinner. When Ethan came in a few minutes later to hunt up a beer, she had met browning potatoes frying. She had meat browning potatoes frying and peanut oil and a salad underway smells great 
He sit awkwardly for a minute. He wasn't used to having someone cook for him. Not for years, and then not a woman. His father had been at home in the kitchen, but his mother... They always joked that whenever she cooked, they needed all her medical skills to survive the meal. It'll be ready in a half an hour or so. Hope you don't mind eating early. I've got to get Aubrey home and bathe and then change for work. I never mind eating, especially when I'm not doing the cooking. The fact is, I want to get to the boatyard for a couple of hours tonight. Oh, she looked back, blowing out of me. You should have told me. I'd have hurried things up. This pace works for me. I took a pull. Pull from the bottle. You want a drink or something? No, I'm fine. I was going to use the salad dressing Phil made up. Looked so much prettier than the store bought. The rain was letting up. Petering out in slow, drizzle drops with watery sunlight struggled to break through. Grace glanced toward the window. She was always hoping to see a rainbow. Anna's flowers are doing well, she commented. The rain's good for them. Saves me from dragging out the hose. She'd have my head if they died on her while she's gone. Wouldn't blame her. She worked so hard getting them planted before the wedding. Grace worked quickly, confidently, as she spoke, draining Cripps' potatoes, adding more to sizzle the oil. Such a beautiful wedding. She went on as she mixed sauce for the meat in a bowl. Come off all right. We got lucky with the weather. Oh, it couldn't have rained that day. It would have been a sin. She could see it all again so clearly. The green of the grass in the backyard, the sparkling of water, the flowers Anna had planted grow glowing with color, and the ones she brought spilling out of pots and bowls alongside the white running that the bride had walked down to meet a groom, white dress billowing, the thin veil only accenting the dark, delicious, happy ones, happy eyes. Chairs had been filled with friends and family, and his grandparents had both wept, and Cam, rough and tumble Cameron Quinn, had looked at his bride as if he'd just been given the keys to heaven. Backyard wedding, Grace thought now. Sweet, simple, romantic, perfect. She's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Grace said it with a sigh. I was only lightly touched with envy. So dark and exotic. She suits Cam. They look like movie stars, all polished and glossy. She smiled to herself as she stirred spice sea sauce into the meat. When you and Philip played that waltz for their first dance, it was the most romantic thing I've ever seen. She sighed again. She finished putting the salad together. And now they're in Rome. I can hardly imagine it. <laughs> they called yesterday morning to catch me for a live. They said they're having a good time. She laughed at that, a rumbling, smoky sound that seemed to curse along his skin. Honeymoon in Rome. It would be hard not to. She started to scoop one more potatoes and swore lightly as oil popped splattered on the side of her hand. Damn! <laughs> Even as she was lifting the slight burn to her mouth, the Susan eased and leaped forward and grabbed her hand. Did I get you? He saw the pink and green skin and pulled her to see. Run some cold water on it. It's nothing. It's just a little burn. It happens all the time. It wasn't if you were more careful. His brown eyes were... His brows were knitted. His hand gripped her fingers firmly to keep her hand under. She wanted... Does it hurt? No. She couldn't feel anything but his hand on her fingers. And her own heart throbbing, thundering in her chest. Knowing she'd made a fool of herself in a moment, she tried to pull free. It's nothing, Ethan. Don't fuss. You need some salve on it. He started to reach up into the cupboard to find some, and his head lifted. Head lifted, his eyes met her. He stood there, water running. Both their hands trampled under the chilly fall of it. Tried never to stand quite so close to her, not so close that he could see those little gold dusk flecks in her eyes, because he would start to think about them, wonder about them. Then he'd have to remind himself that this was Grace, the girl he watched grow up, the woman who was Aubrey's mother, a neighbor who considered him a trusted friend. You need to take better care of yourself. His voice was rough as the words worked their way through her throat. Uh, God does try. Smell the limits. I'm fine. She was dying. Somewhere between giddy pleasure and utter despair. He's holding her hand as if it were his fragile spun glass. He was frowning at her as if she were slightly less sensible than her two-year-old daughter. The potatoes are going to burn easy. Oh, well. Mortified because he's been thinking just for a second that her mouth might taste as soft as it looked. He jerked back, fumbled now for the tube of salve. His heart was jumping, and he hated the sensation. He preferred things calm and easy. <laughs> but some of this on it anyway. He laid it on the counter back. Oh, get the kids washed up for dinner. He scooped up the laundry basket on his way and was gone. With deliberate movements, Grace shut the water off, then turned and rescued her fries. Satisfied with the process of the meal, she picked up the salve and smoothed a little on the reddening splotch on her hand before tidying linen were... Tidily replacing the tube in the cupboard, then she leaned on the sink, looked out the window, but she couldn't find a rainbow in the sky. End of chapter one.